Hi, I just wanted to say how much of how amazing this conference has been. I had never attended before, and it's as good as the early days of any of the, the biggest conferences I've been to, and I hope it continues to grow and maintains the same very high quality, great people, lots of exciting stuff. I learned more about uh, a couple projects that I'd seen on the internet but didn't know in depth uh, during this, this uh, talks yesterday, and it's, it's truly amazing. Uh, so just as a background, uh, I've been uh, in the Cypherpunks mailing list since like 93. I'm not anymore, but like I was in the Cypherpunks mailing list like in 94 or 95. Uh, a very active participant. Uh, I went to MIT early to work on stuff like that as an undergrad and I uh, ended up doing an anonymous electronic cash uh, startup that was like Chamian token based with, it was actually uh, a different algorithm because of a patent dispute, but it was a crazy thing back then. And we couldn't do crypto in the US because of ITAR, the export restriction regime. So I moved to a little Caribbean island, Anguilla, with a couple people that have gone on to do a bunch of other cool projects. And uh, basically built an anonymous cryptographic payment system that was blinded, uh, tokenized, and it failed for a variety of reasons back then. Um, it was basically too early, but uh, it was exciting. I then did an offshore data haven in the North Sea. So there was this World War II anti-aircraft uh, fortress that was built by the British in World War II. They abandoned it after the war. Uh, some people took it over and turned it into a pirate um, uh, radio sort of affiliated group. Um, and then in, in, in like 1967, and then in 99, along with a couple other people, uh, Samir Parekh and a bunch of other cool people, uh, we built an offshore data haven there. We did hosting. It was, it was pretty fun. Um, it went on for a few years. I then uh, went to something completely different and built communications networks in war zones. So Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, all sorts of places in the like, Horn of Africa, other places. I built um, cell phone networks, satellite communication systems. Um, worked with governments and contractors as well as with people that ran like internet cafes. So it was like a huge disparity between those things. I'd never had any direct contact with nation state governments before. And I learned a lot that they're, they're not monolithic entities. They are bad in a lot of ways, but they're bad in lots of little unique ways. So it's a, it was a fun learning experience. Um, then I did a, a startup that was using like Intel TXT, which is a predecessor of SGX to do secure um, remote attestation of VMs, which was kind of a cool thing. Uh, we'd be able to do um, prove what the code was that you're running in a remote VM to people that are that are accessing it remotely and built a, v a VPN on top of that and some other stuff. I sold it to Cloudflare and worked there for a couple years. Uh, then I worked on some secure client devices like uh, travel laptops, like disposable one-time use machines and things like that. Uh, and then I got, a lot of my customers were in cryptocurrency and I had been uh, obviously in, interested in, in crypto since before it was crypto, like back when it was uh, like Chamian tokens and all the stuff that was ho happening in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, I'd kind of given up that any of this stuff would actually get wide adoption in the, the mid 2000s. And so when I saw Bitcoin on the, the, mailing, the cryptography mailing list, it was, it was super exciting. But also I didn't like the fact that there was a, like a global public reg, uh, ledger. So I didn't really think it was that much better than a lot of the technology that existed at the time. So I did not get involved until about 2011, 2012. So I missed out on a little bit. Um, but I started getting involved more and more with uh, cryptocurrency businesses. And now I work for an insurance company in the cryptocurrency space. So I get to see lots of crazy stuff happening, like loss events and everything else, which is pretty fun. Uh, so th the question that I'm going to try to address is whether technology is on balance good or evil. I'm going to go with a sort of a generic thing there and then, then go to something a little bit more specific and more relevant to the interest, but go for the, 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 the like 30,000 meter view and start from there. So there's a bunch of quotes from, from people that are smarter than me. And while a couple of the, most of these people are smarter than me, at least one of them is much crazier than me. But uh, um, yeah, so there's cool stuff here. So basically there's an arc here of people believing that um, Technology is this like powerful force, but it is sort of mysterious and uh, lots of cool stuff there. Um, but ultimately, technology is about people. Like Steve Jobs is right here, uh, and uh, technology itself. You, it's hard to, to ascribe like morality to an inanimate thing or to a force of, of nature, essentially. And uh, people people do drive it. But. Uh, there are definitely people that have spotted the, the negatives of technology. Obviously, when th this was written uh, or said sometime after a, one of the many wars of the 20th century, so uh, yes. And people who have much more experience with war realize that technology is, in fact, uh, potentially very, very dangerous, uh, certain technologies especially. And also the fear that people get lazy and, and basically helpless without technology, dependent upon it as a crutch. Uh, the, the crazy guy. Um, 
So basically, I, I disagree largely with most of what uh, Ted Kaczynski, famously the Unabomber, uh, believed, but uh, he did have a good formulation of what he was uh, advocating, and there have been certainly some, some negative consequences of the Industrial Revolution, and we see those every day, but uh, it's one of those things where it's rational to look at something and look at the positives and negatives, but if you look at something and only focus on the positives or only on the negatives, you are probably a crazy person and you end up doing crazy things. Uh, but yes, so uh, really any technology can be, can be dangerous, can be powerful. Essentially what it is is that something is powerful and it makes it dangerous. And you have to be, you don't really have a choice. It's like not something you can opt into. But yes, so this is fundamentally the closest to what I believe, that you're not building technology in, in uh, the abstract, and you are basically uh, building something and you hope to replace what was there before with, with doing something new and better. And then ultimately, cyberpunks write code. So basically, technology is a powerful tool, and thus it is very dangerous. Uh, it can be used for liberty or oppression, and there's some sort of a taxonomy of what things make things um, more dangerous versus for, for individuals versus the state, incumbents versus, uh, versus new entrants. And context matters a huge amount for this stuff. Uh, the, um, the situation where a new technology is deployed is, is certainly not in a vacuum. It is uh, a question of what uh, state of other technologies exist, what the, the state of um, cohesiveness of society is, everything else. There's a, there's a whole bunch of factors that go into um, into whether a given tool is going to be used for, for what I would consider good or evil. But uh, there's also the problem of prediction, like uh, you can, you can um, look at something up close and sort of predict things, maybe one or two steps, but uh, there might be something lingering in the background that is hard to predict or require things that haven't happened yet that interoperate. So it's, it's uh, difficult. So we've got this, we can look at, so briefly, the, the, the big technological trends of history, we can look at them. Um, we've got uh, big things that have changed how humans are structured. We normally na name the ages of, of society based on the materials used, based on the, the state of human progress, things like that. Um, agriculture is probably the, uh, the first technology that was widely uh, adopted by humanity and largely led to um, people going from a nomadic lifestyle to a fixed lifestyle. So it was really the first industri first revolution. And uh, technologies that applied to this were the, the domestication of plants and animals. It used to be people would, would uh, hunt and gather and they turned into taking certain um, uh, plants and being able to, to plant them reliably every year versus go and catch them in the wild. Uh, animals, they would do animal husbandry and raise like certain animals and things like that. Uh, that, was, that was a level that was not too far from, from how it was originally, but uh, over time we built these uh, societies like ancient Egypt around um, large like hy hydraulic societies where they were built around um, an irrigation system and an irrigation network that basically dominated their entire society and was essentially how their, their society was structured. Uh, then over time, we've gotten to the point of using natural fertilizers and pesticides to synthetic uh, fertilizers and pesticides, uh, the uh, increase of mechanization in farming, uh, the green revolution of the 1960s where uh, a lot of these technologies like, individually were powerful but then brought together and were able to essentially feed uh, like three billion more people than would have been possible before, uh, largely saving uh, many people from starvation. Uh, and now we've got newer things like uh, genetically modified uh, crops and the use of IT in, in farming. Like a crazy thing is I've, I've gone to some, some big uh, agricultural um, farms in the US and you see somebody sitting in a tractor that has more screens in front of them than I do at my home desk and they are uh, completely automated. There's, there's a, definitely a highly skilled person. There's somebody who's gone to college, grad school, everything else running a farm operation. So it is, it is as complicated as anything else in society. It's essentially an industrial um, thing with a huge supply chain and everything else. Um, the interesting thing is, is, is there's that huge scale um, industrial agriculture for, for things like wheat and, and corn and other crops like that. There's also sort of on the uh, more like um, uh, cypherpunk slash uh, counterculture side, the back when marijuana was incredibly illegal uh, in the US uh, from and in most of the world from like uh, 19 whatever 30s to, to basically the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, there was a whole subculture of people that were doing um, crazy uh, 
like um, agricultural science to, to breed different crops and everything else. And that happening in an industry that was essentially illegal and happening at a scale that was on par with what people are doing for, for major food crops is a sign that you can't really repress this technology and people will, will find a way to do stuff. Um, but really, there's, there's my personal priorities in, in how I evaluate these technologies. Uh, I, I largely prioritize things that are pro-individual liberty. Um, th these, are, these are choices. These are, these are my choices. I think people can certainly have different views on where these things are. But I would say that individual liberty prioritized over um, cohesiveness of society or anything else is a goal that I share, uh, I think, with a lot of the hacker community. Um, I believe in continued progress. I think there's like stagnant society is inherently going to end up being more negative than than anything else, and you don't want to have uh, negative change. But but having something stagnant is is likely to be uh, that. But also general well-being. You want to have people be happy. You want to have sort of a somewhat utilitarian view of positive things happening. But but also any model that I have of reality, I want to, any model I have of how things are, I want to be as close to reality as possible. Like you can certainly create a, uh, a model for how technology should be regulated that has very little to do with how technology actually works. You could create a regulation that says uh, something has to be done in a, a way that requires huge adjustments to how it works in order to be, um, to be um, uh, uh, permissible. Um, so you have something that's an inherently distributed technology that's forced to work through central parties and things like that. That is certainly possible, but I don't like that model. And I like uh, returns to people that are actually doing current things versus people that have incumbent position of having a past position. So I would like a new innovator in something to end up able to deploy their technology to the world and have it used, rather than, than saying somebody who built something 200 years ago has this permanent monopoly that they can just sort of hand off to the next person. Um, those are those are my personal priorities. I think they largely align with most of the the hacker community, um, but there might be some some differences. Uh, there's some other technologies um, that was actually out of order. Uh, there's some technologies that were also big trends, uh, exploration. Lots of these these things were developed. Uh, there's the sort of pro uh, nation state things. There's the um, compass sales map making clocks. All these technologies that allowed. Um, certain countries that develop them early to go and explore the rest of the world and, and colonization and everything else. But there's also some more modern things that are letting individuals that are uh, much more um, uh, in, in, in um, opposition to large groups operate. So this, one of the things that the US Air Force created, the GPS, this like, massive technological thing with satellites in orbit and everything else, actually empowers individuals as much as it empowers a state. And then things like UAVs, which have been created over, over a long period of time. Uh, you see a bunch of current conflicts happening, and you have people with, um, with like, literally retail, like $100 to $300 drones that are, that are operating. Uh, warfare is the other thing, and, and there's a, a really good book, uh, The Sovereign Individual, that's probably one of the top three classics of, of this whole genre, that says that the technology of, of force projection is the, uh, the thing that defines society over time, um, and it's gone to be uh, from individuals and uh, efficiency mattering to having the maximum amount of force in a, in a large group mattering to now again efficiency mattering again. But warfare is, is definitely the most um, well-developed uh, form of technology influencing the world, largely for, for negative. But um, it, like scientific progress ha in a war happens so much faster and is it, the things are adopted so much more quickly than they are in any other time. Like there's a projects that take 30, 40 years to happen right, right now that would happen in like uh, six months during a major conflict. Uh, like the materials that were used, the bronze, iron, steel um, periods, uh, fortifications and, steel and, and siege engines, uh, computing was created from, from warfare, from ballistics calculations, from siege engines or from, from cannons, uh, all sorts of things, the like mass production system to make rifles during the 1800s uh, wars, crazy stuff like that. So these are all things that really help large organizations, but then you've got the things that help the smaller groups, like you have cheap UAVs, 3D printing, where you can print firearms on a, a commercially available printer, and you have secure communications. So lots of things that are on, on both sides here. Uh, so what matters is, is like some technologies that are a little bit more um, under development and are near future context. So we're right now in a situation where um, nation states are the dominant form of uh, life on Earth, basically. They, they control essentially everywhere. There is no part of the world that is not at least nominally claimed by a nation state. 
And as nice as it would be to go uh, find some place that was not controlled by nation states, which I, I tried before, uh, it is not a very easy thing. There's some cool stuff happening with uh, like Balaji's uh, network state thing, where the idea is that people can have sort of individual um, self-organizing things like DAOs and everything else that get together and then turn from that into uh, a, uh, a group that gets more and more recognition and it de facto becomes a state and then gets rec recognition. I think that's an interesting concept and it may, may work out, but it's going to take five to 20 years for that really to be proven as a concept. So right now we are in the world of nation states as, as uh, dominant entities, different levels of regulation in different countries. You have uh, some places, especially Europe, that are, that are relatively free with most technologies, at least at an individual level. You have places that are relatively free with companies and large commercial organizations like the US and a few other places. Uh, you have places that are maybe less free on paper but more de facto free because they don't really have effective enforcement of things. And these allow you to have some sort of jurisdictional arbitrage between different locations and all sorts of exciting stuff there. Um, and it allows uh, different technologies to develop and be either positive or negative in different locations. Uh, these are things that I would love to talk about, but I'm not an expert in them. So I think genetic engineering and biotech are going to be uh, things that dramatically change the world over the next, uh, I mean, they've already changed the world. They're going to continue to change the world over the next uh, like 50 years by a huge amount. But my knowledge of that is like college level undergrad and not really particularly sophisticated. I think. As whichever way you, you feel about uh, climate change and, and environment stuff, but it's pretty clear that, that efficiency in energy and resources is a more and more critical thing. There's always been a drive to make things more efficient from a cost perspective, and a lot of things are being priced in, like energy costs right now are, are going through the roof, so uh, that's going to be priced into more things. Uh, resource efficiency the same way. So there's going to be a lot of progress on that. There has been a lot of progress on that over the last uh, like 50 years especially. Uh, that's just going to continue. Uh, robotics and automation is amazing. Uh, you could, whether you consider AI to be part of that or whether you consider that to be part of software, it's the same thing. But the, um, those, are, those are areas that are going to be dramatically uh, world changing. And one of the most exciting things about that is we don't really know how labor responds to that. Like every technology today, everyone always talks about technology potentially getting rid of jobs. It has never happened. Every time there's been a technology, um, developed, it has increased the total number of jobs because people become more specialized. Like, yes, they, they cease doing certain things. Like, agriculture used to be, like, probably 80% of all humanity was involved in producing food. Now it's, like, 2 to 3% of people are involved in producing food. But it's not like all those people don't do anything. They do lots of other stuff. Like, there was no ability to have people creating uh, the kind of technology we have today or anything else, services and everything else, without taking a lot of those people out of the agricultural workforce. Uh, and then the space, quantum, everything else. So these are all, all things that are really awesome, but I would love to talk about them, but maybe in five years if I learn more about them. But I think the areas where we can talk a little bit more confidently and where I think a lot of people have experience would be crypto. There's a huge war. Of what, crypto is cryptography or cryptocurrency. The answer is yes. Um, communication technology, uh, computing, and surveillance and censorship. So cryptography is one of the most interesting technologies because it has uh, such a huge advantage to the defender versus the attacker in most systems. Uh, most things in the world, uh, if they're maybe linear, so if you build a safe, somebody who has roughly the same amount of money or a couple orders of magnitude more can drill into that safe. It's just a delay. Whereas cryptography, if you build something that, um, an encryption algorithm, you can generally have a work factor in the like many millions of uh, orders of magnitude between whether somebody can can do it. Like brute force is potentially the, the easiest way to compromise a, a cryptographic system if it's well designed and it's very difficult. So um, it's it's very unique there. But it's also crazy because like math, like the, the most abstract field of math has become political. And that <laughs> that I did not expect. I studied math as an undergrad a long time ago and uh, yeah, I was not, not expecting it to become as political as it did. Um, through treaties, through um, everything else, uh, freedom of speech issues, the fact that you can, you can wear ammunition on a t-shirt, you were able to do that in the 90s with RSA, and now you can sort of do the same thing with uh, Tornado Cash, so uh, you've got that. And there's Crypto War, I don't know if it's 3.0 or, or 4.0, there was one in the early uh, 80s, one in the late 80s, one in the 90s, and then sort of now, so yeah, maybe it's 4.0, but there's a lot, of, a lot of cryptographic wars. So cryptography is definitely one of these technologies that has uh, a lot of power behind it, and uh, we can view it as potentially good or bad. Um, or some people will view it as good or bad. Cryptocurrency, uh, 
Yeah, also similarly, um, these are the negatives, I would say. Uh, there's sort of the, the whole issue of public ledger privacy. Transparency is good in certain contexts. I like transparency when it's an organization. I don't necessarily want every single one of my transactions to be uh, publicly accessible, and I certainly don't want everyone else's transactions to be publicly uh, viewable by everyone. Uh, there's the whole central bank digital currency movement. I was super into CBDCs when uh, I first saw them a couple years ago. They would potentially be massively more efficient. They would potentially uh, cause a lot of um, uh, efficiency in the like, or individual empowerment for people that are uh, uh, unbanked or that are that are unbanked not by choice but because the banks refuse to work with them. Uh, unfortunately, CBDCs, as everyone is talking about them now, are essentially a financial panopticon, and you would be able to any regulation that was put in place. So if we wanted to say, uh, for instance, meat is banned, you'd be able to instantly click a button and ban like transactions for meat and uh, things like that. So there's that. The cryptocurrency industry, especially in the US, but uh, Europe as well with the travel rule and everything else, has adopted pretty pervasive KYC. It's nice that we have an ATM here where you can use uh, fiat banknotes and, and buy crypto, but that is, you would not be able to do that in the US and there's a lot of places in the world where that would be difficult to do. Uh, it is already the case where you have to provide full documentation of, of pretty much your entire life history to a, a crypto exchange to get onboarded in a lot of countries, and that's kind of scary, one, because of the requirement that you do it, and two, the level of security they, they place on those records. Um, we don't really know the economic models of, of cryptocurrency. A lot of them are deflationary, um, especially Bitcoin, and we don't really know how that works when that becomes a large fraction of the economy. Uh, it's fine when it's, a, a, when it's an escape valve for the existing economy, but when it becomes a, a large thing, we don't really know how that'll interoperate. Like, I certainly feel uh, anxiety and loss whenever I spend any, any Bitcoin whatsoever, even though I can just immediately repurchase it for fiat, but I, it feels like a loss, so there's that. There's also scams and crime. So there's the, uh, I guess, a famous quote from a lot of people that were basically speed running the last like 200 years of financial crime and scams in the crypto world, and you see a bunch of people creating uh, like Ponzi schemes, everything else within this space. And that sort of, um, one, it is it scares people away because if your first contact with crypto is, is somebody um, scamming you, uh, you're probably going to not really want to be involved in the future. And if that becomes the public perception that that's what it is, it becomes very easy for regulators to say, uh, like, th this is all bad. It was sort of like the Tornado Cash situation where um, Tornado Cash had many, many good uses, and there's at least six of them that are in a lawsuit right now, uh, very positive things. But because it became a, a sufficiently public perception, they were able to, to go after it. And then centralization risk. Like, a lot of cryptocurrency is uh, very centralized. You have a lot of the... Uh, Bitcoin is probably the most decentralized. A lot of other projects are, are, in, are inherently, like, terrifyingly uh, centralized. And even the relatively decentralized ones have centralized infrastructure in place, and it's, uh, it's not great. Uh, communications tools are, now we have great things. They're global, they're pervasive, they're costless, uh, but there's, and there's borders, but the borders are really only artificial. So it used to be the, the Great Firewall of China was the exception, and it's increasingly becoming the rule, where you've got uh, national-level filtering of, of information and uh, we're getting that more and more. Either they're filtering it on the ingress or the egress. Um, so it's pretty scary. But I'd say the, the scariest thing about our communication infrastructure today is that it's basically all run by third parties, all run by um, relatively large corporations that are fairly interestingly regulated. Like uh, tele uh, telecommunications providers have like an obligation to make data available and retain records in a way that most other companies don't, uh, outside of banking and in certain other industries. So it's truly crazy that we've outsourced all of this stuff. And in a lot of countries, there have been court rulings or laws that essentially provide you with no ability to push back against uh, any sort of request if it's made to a third party on your behalf. So if, if I use a cell phone or if I use a mail hosting provider, or, or uh, maybe mail's a bad example, but any other form of internet hosting, and somebody goes to that internet host with a request, uh, they can, they can uh, compel that host to provide the data with a much lower bar than if I had that data in my home. So it's, um, it's pretty terrifying, and this is all corporate infrastructure, and uh, corporations at least have relatively rational um, uh, goals in what they do. They, they largely act in their own relatively rational self-interest, but that is not often or is, is often not aligned with, with your interests or with the interests of certain people. So it's, a, it's sort of a terrifying thing that's, ha that's happened. 
Uh, computing is the other, other big technology uh, area where we've also gone from people being able to inspect their technology. So maybe start with like the IBM PC level of technology where there was an open standard or a relatively open standard that people could, could purchase from multiple vendors. They could, they could uh, work with stuff. You could write software on your computer. There was a period of time before that where you essentially had to write all of your own software, and uh, also communities like the Unix community before that, where maybe the hardware came from some big companies, but the software was all open source and developed by a lot of people. But uh, that is not the case today for the vast majority of people. Most people, uh, computing experience is a cell phone. Uh, they have a choice largely between uh, Apple iOS, which is very closed and run by one organization, or Google Android, largely run by Google, like not even the forks. Uh, there are some great options uh, besides that, but, but largely we have a duopoly of two large U.S. corporations that largely control the computing ecosystem, and for an individual end user, they don't have much ability to, uh, to change that, to write their own software, to do anything else. So it's, it's gone from, it, this is an area where we've gone backwards from that. And pretty much every country uses the same infrastructure. There's a couple outliers, like there's a, I guess, red flag Linux and a couple other things that a couple countries in Asia are trying to work on, but, but largely these are a couple companies and they're US companies that control almost everything. And then, of course, the surveillance uh, ecosystem, where uh, stuff's, uh, you're, you're actually paying uh, money to have a surveillance device in your pocket 24-7, um, and your cell phone, and it tracks pretty much everything. Um, there's a CCTV everywhere, crazy stuff like the light. There's a lot of the technology where uh, it matters uh, to a degree when it happens at small scale, so like um, CCTV around your office and things like that, maybe that, that gives some level of, of privacy compromise, but if it's uh, pervasive and people can start picking up those feeds, automatically recognize license plates in the feed, see where all the cars are, every intersection that you drive through, and then start doing face recognition of all the people that are in image. Like retail shops now have systems that take their, their uh, sort of like security cameras and can feed and, and get profiles of every customer that comes in the shop and build a profile of what they've purchased, what they've looked at, everything else, just purely in software, running on commodity, um, like DVR kind of stuff. So it's pretty crazy. And then you've got all this data, but then you combine it together. So if you can cross-correlate uh, where you've been, all the people you've talked to, everything else, along with uh, your purchase records from online, everything else, that gives you a lot more data than if you um, had these as, as individual silos. So we're pretty much at the point of, of this stuff being um, uh, that it, there's, on, by, on, on balance, a lot of things have uh, much stronger negatives. So. I think there's some reasons for optimism, but um, the, the, the position we're in is not the, the greatest position that we, we've ever been in. Uh, yeah, there's, there's been sort of a, uh, a, a trend, um, especially, like, I was much more optimistic about uh, technology complete, uh, maybe it was because I was younger, but it was, I was generally very pro-technology, like nothing could, in, there would be negative things, but they would be dramatically outweighed by the, the positives back in the 90s, uh, early 2000s. Um, but I think there have been some changes in the past uh, 10 to 15 years that have made that a much harder position to completely support. Uh, I would say the um, dominance of certain large monopoly corporations, like it used to be you had monopolies in things that were um, hardware manufacturers, but you'd have lots of open software providers. And there's a level of, of negativity that a hardware provider can do, but if you're buying their hardware fundamentally, that's a choice, and they, you're not, it, it's easy enough to compete there. If it's something that has massive network effects, like a lot of uh, software systems do, you don't really have that level of competition, and you don't have that level of, of exit as an option. Like, ultimately, it doesn't matter how secure my, my self-hosted mail server is, if every other person I'm talking to uses, like, Gmail, uh, I'm, I'm screwed because my mail is in Gmail and I don't really have any, any counter to that. Uh, there's uh, people that are pushing back against this stuff, a lot of the people in the room, a lot of the people at the conference, a lot of the people in the, the hacker community, but I would say the, uh, the general societal push has been toward making things uh, probably less safe or, or less inherently uh, private or pro-individual over the last period of time. Um, Stuff that I find exciting, which uh, maybe is not going to be stuff that uh, is, is universally popular with people, but I think is awesome. Um, I'd say unregulated markets, um, free ROS, uh, and um, I'd say the, the, the negatives, like certainly there's, there's lots of negatives to drugs, but the negatives of 
the illegal drug trade dramatically exceed the negatives of anything that's ever happened in, in drugs otherwise. So uh, Silk Road was probably uh, a thousand times more positive than it was negative. Um, there's uh, lots of craziness around that case, but there's that. Uh, Jim Bell, who apparently spoke here in 2017, uh, I know him from the Cypherpunks mailing list, and the crazy fact is uh, I ran an archive of the Cypherpunks mailing list back then, and the, uh, I think it was the IRS CID emailed me when I was uh, like 18 years old to give them to come and testify about my mailing list archive with his messages on it to uh, say like these were, were valid messages and everything else. Uh, I emailed Jennifer Granick, who at the time was a, a very young lawyer, about uh, what should I do? I'm living in Anguilla, this little Caribbean island at the time. I don't really think this request was proper and also was technically incorrect. Like, I ran a mailing list archive that accepted mail from any arbitrary email address on the internet. You could send me a fake message and it would get archived, send it with the wrong date, whatever else. So I could not testify to what they were saying. And she said, don't come back to the US because if you come back to the US, they can keep you here as long as they want and make you testify. So I stayed out of the country for like six months. And he uh, did get convicted, unfortunately. His defense team did not take my... Uh, assistance to like um, repudiate the email archives, but um, yeah, it sucks. But yeah, assassination politics is this idea that you can essentially predict, uh, I, I can briefly summarize it, but like definitely watch his talk, but essentially you can predict uh, the time, place, and manner of, of someone's uh, demise, and if you predict correctly, then you get a payout, and there's an easy way to make sure that you win the bet. So. Uh, that becomes a sort of a negative thing for anyone who is in a position of oppressing large numbers of people, and there's that. Uh, I think that's, that's, a, that's not necessarily an unalloyed force, force for good. However, uh, there's an example. There was the uh, Basque separatist group, uh, ETA, that was famous for not liking a particular power plant in being constructed in their area, and they uh, basically told the director of the power plant that you should not be the director of the power plant, uh, you should resign or else your safety is at risk. Um, and they did this repeatedly uh, to each successive one after the guy mysteriously died, uh, and that caused them to cease building this power plant. So this, if you're going to look at it on a, on a balanced scale, I'd say assassinating very small numbers of people is certainly far less negative than like, global wars. So um, this is potentially, is, this is an, sort of, I would say it's inevitable now that we have an anonymous electronic cash, so whether it's good or bad, whatever, but it, it is inevitable. Uh, ransomware, uh, the next generation of ransomware is going to be truly terrifying. Um, now that you have essentially anonymous electronic payments, we're, we're not quite there, but within two or three years from that, uh, you would be able to, as an insider in an organization, as soon as you find out any vulnerability that happens within your organization, you would be able to anonymously contact the uh, ransomware serv service provider businesses that are out there and uh, tell them about this vulnerability. They would exploit your own organization. You would have all the insider information about like, how much they'd be willing to pay, whether they're going to law enforcement, their timescales, everything else like that, and essentially would be able to steer this toward getting a payout. This will, in the short term, be horrible because it'll mean that lots of ransomware happens, lots of hospitals go offline, lots of businesses get screwed over, everything else. In the long term, it might actually be positive because it will cause technology to um, prioritize. Like, there, there's a lot of information security that is difficult. There's also a lot of information security that's really, really easy, like using single sign-on, using uh, uh, a lot of uh, technology that is sort of table stakes at a well-run organization, but it does cost money and time, and so lots of organizations don't do it. So this might raise the floor for how secure stuff is, which would be good, um, but it would be at a great cost. Uh, there's also all sorts of crazy stuff about the economics of ransomware, and I think it's going to become a uh, problem at the scale of, uh, like, not quite existential, but a problem at a very, very great scale. Uh, over the next like two or three years. Uh, the general war on general purpose computing. Uh, you see all these, these negative things, or the things that a state would view as negative. You see unregulated markets and people doing assassination markets and anonymous crypto and everything else. Their solution to this might be you're not allowed to have a computer anymore, or essentially you're not allowed to have a computer that you can write software for. And if they do that, uh, that, is, uh, that is a line that is, that is well beyond my red line. Uh, that, is, that is like miles away from my red line, but uh, the, the inability of people to build stuff on their own and, and freely deploy it would be basically the end of, of um, anything interesting and worthwhile happening and would ossify the entire um, the state and everything else. 
uh, crazy stuff that's happening, uh, or crazy, crazy good stuff that's happening. The, the general, the DAO industry, or the idea of people being able to coordinate in large groups with payment built in, like people have always been able to communicate and coordinate, but getting something that involves physical action and involves committing resources to it is a much more difficult problem, and that's the thing that, that DAOs really enable. But as we've seen, uh, I guess with the Julian Assange DAO and a bunch of other things, the DAOs that are doing more edgy things are limited by the level of privacy that the base layer blockchains they're built on support. But we saw yesterday the Anon DAO and some other things in that space that mean that you can basically communicate and organize fully anonymously and do arbitrary actions. So any of these things that you want to build, you can do. There's the maker movement. So there's these big companies that, that build a lot of technology that we use today. Like I am unfortunately, I largely use Apple stuff for, for like office IT stuff and I use Linux for my um, like more secure computing and servers, but I still am buying computers from huge companies and they're in countries that are openly hostile and everything else. So um, it's, it's not great, but there's a movement of people building uh, hardware and software. Uh, there's, there's cool stuff happening, like the precursor device that the Bunny's working on, and a bunch of other cool stuff like that, that is um, sort of uh, pushing back against that. I don't know how commercially successful it's going to be or how widely successful it will be, but it's a great thing. And now that we have DAOs and we have crypto, we can, we can actually fund a lot of these things. The biggest challenge we've had with a lot of these things, and the reason why I think uh, cryptocurrency failed in the, in the 1990s before, before Bitcoin and everything else, was sort of the bootstrapping problem of there's no way to get people to build this kind of stuff without being a large institution, and a lot of these technologies are inherently hostile to large institutions, so they don't want to fund it, so how do you do it? Uh, now that there is, I mean, wh however it happened, there's lots of crazy history to it, but now that crypto is a widely deployed tool that lots of people have and millions of people have balances, they can fund things that they want to have funded and that will change a lot of things. There's some things that you might think of as negative that are actually sort of positive. Like the, if you look at like cell phones, it used to be I wanted a new cell phone basically every six months, every year when they came out, they'd have a, or when smartphones were there because they were so bad that the next one was a little bit less bad. Uh, things like it wouldn't last all day on battery, it wouldn't be powerful enough to do everything. Now, like a four or five year old device is still a pretty good device and you don't really need to replace things as frequently. You replace them because the battery wears out, that's really the main thing, or if you lose it. So because this progress curve is starting to flatten out, maybe it's because of the like diminishing returns, maybe it's because uh, chips have gotten, like chip fabs have gotten so much more expensive to build, the, the cycle time there, maybe it's this artificial COVID supply chain issue, but basically like multi-year product cycles are now a norm. It used to be you'd have to build stuff very quickly and it would become obsolete, so you'd have to sell it all within six months or 12 months, so you couldn't sell it in the marketplace. Now that you can do, you could realistically say, I'm gonna build something in five years and start working on it now, and in five years it'll be a, a decent product, and you can sell it for a few years. Uh, it means that a smaller team with less resources can actually build stuff. Uh, and there's stuff like this, like Apple Watch, which required a huge company to build, but there's companies like Pebble that existed like before this, and they were able to, with, with small numbers of millions of dollars, build something that was, at the time, very comparable. And today, you could build hardware devices that are, that are relatively cheaper to, to do the engineering for and build that do a lot of the functionality. So maybe it's, maybe it's only 50% as good as the thing the big company is making, but it's uh, a free, free product, like a, with a freedom product and you would, we would be able to sell it in the marketplace. And because these markets are now huge, like you have billions of cell phone users out there, you have uh, billions of people on the internet, you have even like a niche technology like, uh, like gaming cards is massively deployed, you actually have the opportunity to build something for 1% of that market is now a huge market. So if you just took the people that care about privacy and individual sovereignty and build a product for them, you could actually build a cell phone now for 1% of the cell phone market and it would be a large enough market to, to justify manufacturing. So uh, we're a little bit more positive there. And we also have accumulated the negative examples of uh, bad things happening with, um, with privacy and, and security. Like, I think pretty much everybody has had their data breached by some corporation in a, in a hack, like, multiple times. Like, you get free credit monitoring or whatever, so woo, collect that. But uh, that, that happens to everyone, so everyone is familiar with it. It's a lot harder to talk about things that are sort of abstract threats, but when they are a, uh, a thing that has happened to you personally or to people you know. Like, I think pretty much everybody that has a small business has heard of somebody that they know that has a small business that has a, ran a ransomware event. And I was explaining to somebody who runs a publishing company uh, how it's not okay to have your backups be accessible on the internet and re re you, you shouldn't be able to overwrite your, uh, your backups for all of your data from your admin accounts that are also live because if someone compromises that stuff, they'll be overwriting your backups as well. 
Uh, and it was pretty easy to point at examples where exactly that threat model had happened. So there's a lot of, there's different ways to learn. You can learn through uh, like studying things. You can also learn by looking at other people that have had bad examples and, and copying that. So yeah, lots of cool stuff that's happening. And uh, I think the, the general trend, like I, technology is becoming more and more powerful and technology is becoming more accessible to some people to create, but you have to choose to do so. And it's inspiring to see that a lot of people are, are choosing to take their, uh, their personal time, to take their, their, their hobby is building new and amazing technology for, for liberty around the world. So, cool. And I'd like to take any questions that, are, that are, anyone has. Thank you very much. And I see first question. Thank you, Ryan, for an interesting talk. Um, a lot to take in here, uh, honestly, in a short period of time. I guess what I'd like to ask is, um, what do you see as kind of the emerging technologies that are poised to really bring about change in the next, say, 10 years, positive or negative? Yeah. Uh, as far as the, the technologies that are most likely to change, like I would love it to be cryptocurrency. Uh, honestly, we have had cryptocurrency now for like 12 years. It has not changed the broader world as much as I would like. Um, it has certainly changed a lot. It has changed a moderate number of people's lives a lot. It has created a existence proof of stuff that could exist, but it has not gone the same way the internet. Like if you took the internet, uh, the commercial the consumer internet, it's like 1995 to let's say uh, 2007, there was more influence on the individual person. Like my parents don't need to know about crypto. If my parents lived in Ukraine or something and needed to move their money out of Ukraine, yes, they would know, need to know about crypto, but my parents living in the US don't need to know about crypto. It doesn't really affect them, uh, whereas the internet does. So. There's, there's technologies that have a lot of promise that have under-delivered there. Uh, I would also say that like AR, VR has been sort of hyped more than it's delivered. Uh, energy technology is probably the thing that is obviously going to be positive or obviously going to be important and uh, might be negative or positive. Like we, we, the, the, it was like two months ago, we were terrified that like power in Europe was going to be unavailable during periods of time, and it's already causing industrial uh, curtailment and everything else. So uh, there's things that are sort of very obvious there, and then there's things that are uh, less obvious. I would say anonymous communication is the and anonymous payments are the highest potential leverage thing that may or may not be adopted, and it's really going to be uh, down to whether people build, like, it's crazy that like, whether something is adopted or not can sometimes come down to whether like a good document is available, it's like a training document for it or a good user interface. Like there's a bunch of technologies out there that, that were way ahead of their time and never really got adopted purely because of some accidental things about licensing or about uh, which uh, documentation or e easy adoption or, or, like, or whatever other deals. So I'm, I'm still gonna hold out for crypto as the thing that hopefully will have the greatest hopefully positive impact, but the greatest impact um, relative to what it would be based on the effort that people put into it. Um, and yeah. So. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I will take my opportunity to ask. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that uh, after your experience with uh, state organizations, you found out some uh, surprising evil <laughs> Yeah. Uh, sites. Uh, can, can, you, can you share with us <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. a little bit more about this? Yeah. Uh, like, which, for right. example, surprised yeah. you the most? Yeah. So an interesting story. I was basically a a bootstrap defense contractor. I I started a defense contractor in Iraq because I knew some Iraqis on LiveJournal in 2003 that wanted to go to Iraq after the U.S. invaded to build the first internet exchange because the country was going to be so incredibly safe after Saddam was gone that everyone would move back, start up ISPs, and we'd have to set up a peering location for them in Baghdad. Uh, that was very wrong. Uh, I was there and it turned into a complete war zone. I started having more contact with like the Iraqi government, the U.S. government, a bunch of the, the NATO forces, everyone else. Uh, I used to think of them as like a monolithic entity that had clear goals and was maybe inefficient, but like that, they're, they're so inherently multicellular and they have completely different goals that have no 
they're not really consistent. Like you can have completely working at cross purposes organizations. You can have like civil affairs things that are trying to build up like relationships with local people at the same time. Like the other people are overly aggressively uh, doing security patrols that like clear villages or whatever else. So um, it's not so much evil. It's lots of people that only see like a very small part of their their mission and they're given that and they focus on that and they don't look at a, a bigger picture and they have no incentives to do and there's not really it's a problem of a hierarchy that you're you only see up and down you don't see to the sides and uh, that happens especially across organizational boundaries so you could have like a, a crazy thing where there's a one area controlled by like one military unit and one controlled by another mili military unit that to me as an outsider look exactly the same. Like they're wearing the same uniforms, they, they do the same things, but one of them has a policy of like, if you come up to our vehicle, we'll shoot you immediately. The other one is come up to our vehicle and we'll give you water. So you don't know that in advance and it's completely unfair to expect someone to like telepathically figure this out. Uh, so yeah, it's, it, I wouldn't say it's evil. It's more just like complete disorganization and an organ or it's an organizational structure that is not that doesn't fit reality. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there is technology which is more f um, driving towards liberty and other technologies more like repressive. And have you identified any principles which lead to technology that is more liberating? And um, do you have any ideas how we could use these principles to you know, steer the development of technology in that direction? Oh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Uh, yes, there's definitely uh, some factors that you, you, you can't predict things at a long time horizon or in a very chaotic environment, but the, the things that generally make technology more pro-liberty and pro-individual pro would be uh, permissionless entry into innovating in a space. If something is uh, inherently um, controlled by incumbent providers and you can't create a new entity in the space, that usually ends up with some sort of capture by either regulators or incumbents for their own purposes. Maybe their purposes are good purposes, but you don't have any control over it. So if it's a, um, uh, probably a good example, an emerging one is AI. There's the whole movement, like the AI safety movement, where people want to uh, say that there's a potential that AI is going to get so incredibly powerful so quickly that it'll take over the entire world. So instead, we want to regulate this technology incredibly carefully and say that only government approved labs can work on it and uh, there's a idea of, of being very safe about it, making sure that all these controls exist. And what has happened in, in uh, over the last like three months on the internet with uh, Dolly and uh, stable diffusion and everything else, I mean that's certainly not going to take over the world, but it's maybe an early thing. You can see technologies where OpenAI was trying to keep this technology very tightly bottled up within their organization, and like uh, months later, people created something entirely independently that was just as good that had none of the regulations in place and uh, had power. So um, there's, there's that. So I'd say centralization is something there and also just the pace at which things are um, innovating. Like if it's something where you can, like chip fabs, like chip fabs happen at a scale of maybe five years to deploy a new one. You can predict exactly how good the result's going to be in advance. Like you know what the, the micro, it might not work, but you know the best it's going to be. You might know yields and things like that. Uh, but if it's something uh, in software usually, you might not, like I, I'm pretty good at predicting certain enterprise technologies, whether they're gonna be adopted or, or successful. If it's a consumer technology, like, like I, no one would have predicted like Facebook would end up being responsible for one, have like billions of users, and two, responsible for like ethnic slash whatever riots in multiple countries and civil wars and everything else. That is unpredictable. So anything that involves large numbers of end users and uh, more like uh, human factors as opposed to te technological factors is probably a lot harder to predict. Thanks. And maybe for those who would like to uh, stay in touch with you or follow your work or possibly uh, contact you, is there some way or where, how would you recommend? Yes. Those? Uh, yeah, I'm on, unfortunately, Twitter as Octal and also uh, generally on the internet. I'm hoping that there will be new, um, I would love there to be a crypto community discussion forum that is not a large corporation controlled uh, platform. There's a lot of great person-to-person -person messengers like Signal, Threema, uh, things like that. There is not yet a great alternative to something like Telegram or uh, Discord or Twitter or something else like publishing. So hopefully some of these tools that are being created by the, the movement will, will do that. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you stay with us until the rest of the evening. So uh, uh, whoever wants
ones can approach you personally. Right. But thanks for coming. Right. Uh, I think it uh, deserves applause. Thank you.